Welcome, everybody. I'm Noreen Savage, and this is Starting Out Bright. Thanks for being here. And you're in for a treat because Ed Pettit is in the house. Yes. So in case we haven't met you and I, um, as I said, I'm Noreen Savage, and I am, first of all, nobody official with Brightline Eating, but the program has done a lot for me, and I got acquainted through a random tech, a random post on Facebook, my friend Lori had said she lost 57 pounds with a program called Brightline Eating. Anybody interested could just send her a message. So that's what I did. From there, I found out the four bright lines, no sugar, no flour, three meals a day, weighed and measured portion. After I got over that shock, I just felt sunk. I thought there was absolutely no way that I could do that. But my friend and I got together for lunch, and she explained further the program, that it was doable. And she suggested to me to get the book, Bright Line Eating by Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson, and to get into the community, the Bright Line Eating community. And she mentioned We Eat Bright with Lines, which is a private Facebook group and still going strong. We have Starting Out Bright connected with the Zoom chats and other private group, but there are recipe groups and many other groups where thousands of people every day are getting together to do this thing with no sugar, no flour. So I got in the group, I got the book, and I just sat and I watched people in the group transform their lives. They were losing weight, like a lot of weight, 50, 100, 150 pounds. And that gave me so much hope because where was I? I was 270 pounds, five foot two. I had been dieting literally for decades. And when I saw all of this, I told myself if I got started and lasted one year, I would do what my friend Lori did. I would post in Facebook and help anybody I could just as she did. Well, the year came up, I was sitting in that chair right behind me. And I thought, what am I going to post to inspire someone else? And I'm a Christian. I felt God say to me, Noreen, you can do more than that. You could help others by getting them together on Zoom and connecting them. That's what I did. And that's why we're here where we are. And I'm so anxious to get to Ed that I'm sure I'm forgetting some things. I just want to tell you where I was, 270, was not just a number. What it meant was swollen feet, extremely painful knee, sleep apnea, snoring, waking up my husband every night, all of the bad things you don't want. And now I am uh, about 95 pounds down. I'm not still at goal yet, but... I am feeling really great, and I'm so glad to be here. So with that, I'm going to welcome you, Ed. Thanks for being here. I'll give you a chance to say hi, and then I've got questions for you. All right. Well, thank you, Noreen. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I just so appreciate 
what you do, as we say, for fun and for free, and Deb Babcock as well, I, I just think it's awesome. Uh, open-handed generosity, compassion, kindness in the direction of others who are suffering. And this is a disease that th those of us who have been afflicted with uh, compulsive overeating, food addiction, morbid obesity, it is a painful journey. So yes. what you do for fun and for free, it's, it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Well, thanks, Ed. And I'm going to, I want to talk about what you do too. Um, first though, I want to mention for those who have not met you, that the first time that we got together was back in April of 2021. So it's been a couple years since then, but you haven't been a stranger. You've been in Starting Out Bright. You've been in other groups, just sharing wholeheartedly your, your messages of hope. And I want to get into that. Um, going back to, you know, that first, that first Zoom chat that we had, um, I remember you mentioning that you started in Brightline Eating January of 2020, and you quickly took the weight off uh, from my memory. It was within the year, and you can say how much that was, but it wasn't the first time that you got to your right size body, was it? It was not. And as I saw some of those pictures you had shared, it reminds me of the many varied sizes of, uh, of Ed, uh, through the years. And, um, yeah, when I started right line eating, uh, mid January of 2020, I got to my right size body, uh, probably by the summertime and following the plan. And I had a Excel table and a graph that I was using to kind of monitor the, the weekly weigh in, but it took me several months, but, uh, it was steady it was steady progress toward that goal. So when you, when you said before you had gotten to the to your right body, you had tried some pretty tough stuff. You had followed, I think, the Physician's Weight Plan. Physician's Weight Loss Center. This was back um, in uh, 1989, 1990, and I was successful with it. I followed it um, for the prescription. I had to go in and meet with the people in the white lab coats to uh, – uh, use one of those test strips to make strips to make sure I wasn't cheating. I was in ketosis and I paid for their maintenance program. I did that for a full year. And I was sharing with you last night, Noreen, that I remember it was the October of uh, 1991. And my mom was in the process of dying. And after a year of being in my right size body, uh, I quote, started eating again. And I couldn't stop. I gained 140 pounds. And uh, it was 10 years later that I stepped into my first 12-step meeting for compulsive overeaters in 2001. So my, my sobriety date is December 12th, 2020. Um, but, but I had uh, a rough fall uh, getting to that point of that year. After I got to my right size body, <clears throat> I started eating off plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's been my pattern in again, out again, up again, down again, on again, off again. And uh, this past two and a half years has really been a very unique part of my journey. Whereas I would say that sobriety was largely elusive um, until 2020, uh, when at the end of the year, I sort of came to my senses around some key themes. And uh, I've been sober every day since. A lot of gratitude and uh, not a lot of pride because this was not about Ed fixing Ed. But when you say you were you're bright from then, do you mean when you got back on track, or do you? Yeah, mean that was when I I, I was having uh, my buddy called it recreational eating. You know, it's kind of crazy because I'm weighing my three meals a day, and then after dinner, I get out a bowl and put an extra something, something in there and thinking, I really thought I could handle it. And uh, interesting, I stopped weighing my body. And I thought my clothes are still fitting. And it was three months before I stepped on the scale and saw that I gained 12 pounds. And um, I had made some reach out calls, I didn't want to do what I was doing, but I, I couldn't stop. And uh, I remember some of the things that were triggering me. And that was a big choice for me to say these trigger foods, even though they're, quote, compliant, 
uh, they're not my food. And I had to come to terms with that. Um, so that was uh, yeah, mid-December of 2020 after my three-month final, last and final research project is what I like to call that. I don't okay. need to do any more research. Well, and one thing you've mentioned on that first call that we had, you got serious about um, with a, a check-in with your buddy, correct? Are you yes. still doing that? Still because doing I, I thought that was pretty unique. Talk about that. Yeah, and this was part of my um, kind of awakening process. Uh, I, I love this three-letter acronym. I think Noreen might have had it at the start, NLA, No Longer Alone. And I've been learning to, I, I call it sometimes, one anothering, to be uh, connected to other men in a way that really makes a difference for me. And um, this comes from a guy that was pretty emotionally shut down and it might have appeared to have a lot of relational activity, but I was hiding. I was hiding in my disease. I was pretending. Um, I was suffering in silence and putting on sort of the happy face and people didn't know. And what a gift it is for me to have authentic connections with other men where um, I like this little saying, I, I've heard it said that uh, most men will, will come together and, and you kind of compare and you talk about uh, things that are working well and what you've accomplished and it creates competition. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about our vulnerabilities, our weaknesses, our brokenness, it creates a compassionate community where actual authentic healing can happen. And that's more and more what I've been experiencing uh, but I learned that so often in my journey, I feel alone and Ed can't fix Ed. That's part of it. So I've got an accountability partner who's in uh, my recovery program with me. And before I eat my meal, I just take a picture, I send it. And that's my commitment. I'm going to eat exactly and only what's in the picture. And uh, once I'm done, I'm done. It's not about going back for seconds or thirds. And uh, that's a practice that I started uh, at some point, and that's uh, been something that I can continue to this day. So that's no tricks, no tips, but just truly that's the rule. Uh, yeah, well, with sometimes sometimes I'll say that for me, now I'm, I'm of a certain class of individual. So my peak weight was over 330 pounds, and I'm now consistent, consistently weighing about 180 pounds. When I started Brighton Lane 80, I was probably back up to 250. And um, I think I probably have shared this out on starting off right, but, but three words come to mind. I know what it's like to wallow in the disease. And I looked that up and it's kind of like what a pig does in the mud. Unrestrained engagement. And that was me, a, a lot of time wallowing in the disease. And then ameliorate, I had to look that word up when I first saw it, but it's making a bad situation better. And it's true that 250 pounds is actually better than 330 pounds. But there's this third word and uh, immunity. I, I can have and I do have full on immunity from the disease of compulsive overeating. And, and it's because what I've learned is, uh, so I'm, I'm of a particular class of individual where I'm, I'm actually an addict. I think a lot of people that come into bright line eating, we've got the susceptibility scale and people don't have the same kind of chronic condition uh, that I have. Uh, some perhaps do, um, but I, I like how Susan has the susceptibility scale. If somebody's a six or a seven, they may not have to have the same, same kind of program that I, that I have to have. But I know for me, I can't do moderation, not even a little bit. And um, I, I, I've, got, I've got my um, AA big book here. It actually is a big book because it's a study book, but there's so much that I've learned in the last year as I've studied with other men uh, in my recovery fellowship, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and understanding it to be very relevant for uh, those of us who are compulsive overeaters and food addicts. And part of it, it talks about uh, two concepts. One is that for the true alcoholic or for the true compulsive eater, um, I have to... Um, uh, smash the idea that, well, someday I'll be able to eat like other people eat. And the big book talks about that has to be smashed. And it also uses this term called uh, lurking notions. 
no lurking notions that someday I'll be able to handle a little something extra. And um, the third thing I mentioned in, in the, at the front of the big book is a, a section called the doctor's opinion. And the doctor's opinion is essentially saying uh, for those of us that are of this class that are confirmed addicts, um, there, there's two elements to it. There's a physical craving of the body and there are certain trigger foods that will uh, spur that on. And once that starts, it's, it's hard to stop. And then the other thing is called a, an obsession of mind. Um, and that the true addict has lost the power of control and has lost the power of choice. So I resonate with this. And it's been helpful for me to connect with other men in recovery for food addiction and study the big book of AA to recognize when, when I say the struggle is real, I get it. I've suffered long term, uh, not only as an adult, but uh, as a kid as well. I was the heaviest kid in my eighth grade class, weighing more then than I do today. And I was not as tall as I am. And, uh, and the comment here is uh, something I think you've posted before. And, and from that doctor's opinion, allergy allergy of the let me see of the body i'm allergic to sugar and flour deb says that yes. and yes. I, I believe that was in the doctor's opinion too about being allergic it's about alcohol but but yeah an alcoholic has a, a, a phenomenon where they're actually allergic to the alcohol and they crave more and uh, not everybody has that reaction um you know the big book talks about uh, hard drinkers, uh, moderate drinkers. And it says there's a certain class of people that are alcoholics. And I think it's true for food addicts as well. There are certain people that are hard eaters. Um, you know, people who are obese or even morbidly obese may not have a condition of compulsive overeating or food addiction. And, and for some people, th this is kind of the tips and tricks. A good food plan like Bright Line Eating and some support may be plenty enough to help people get into a recovered physical right size body. But for a guy like me, that's where I say tips and tricks don't work. I need something more. A food plan is, is a great thing. And I have, uh, I just love what bright lighting has helped me with because when I came into recovery, what I heard was, well, we suggest that you avoid flour and we suggest that you avoid sugar and we suggest you don't go through drive-ins. And, and for a guy like me, these suggestions were too, um, uh, they just weren't strong enough for me, right? I wasn't, I didn't have the willingness to embrace them. And, uh, you know, so, but there was something about the Bright Line Eating book with the science. And uh, I, I love the page where it has the four white substances. And when you take something and refine it into its essence, and ingest it, it changes the substance and it changes how I process that. So that, that really resonated with me. There was a quick little question. How tall are you, Ed? You said that I'm over- six foot, oh. even. six foot even. Six foot, okay. So yeah. I, wanna, I wanna go back to that word you said, immunity. Do you feel like, I, I mean, immunity to me would be like, you know, I will not get the disease again. But so, what do you do? I mean, it's it's one thing to know what to do, but what do you do when you have these, or or don't you really feel the craving anymore? Yeah. So let me let me speak to that a little bit. And my intent in being here tonight, when Noreen invited me to come back and join her for a conversation, this is not about me having an ego and looking for kudos. It's not. I, when I say the struggle is real, I get it. I, I have compassion for those that are suffering because I've been a person who suffered much. And the other part of it is freedom is possible. It really is. And that's my hope is to extend hope to others who may be suffering. So while we're talking about me, you know, my mind is going toward what might be helpful to those that might be listening who have been uh, stuck long term like I was. And oftentimes, uh, you know, I used to post in the Brightline Eating official community before it closed down, and uh, and that and then it kind of closed down. And uh, I think Noreen, what 
there's over 3,000 members here in this community. Mm -hmm. Maybe not everybody's active, but so often we can see it among our group here. People go back into the food again and again, and we've got this concept of resuming, and uh, we're always invited to do that. But here's the message of the big book as it pertains to alcoholics. Put down the substance and pick up the spiritual solution. It's very clear about that. For this type of individual that is a confirmed addict, um, the, the recommendation is you put down the substance. But if I'm going to continue to go back to um, the big book uses of the term, uh, trying to get that sense of ease and comfort, they talk about it by taking the first drink. But if we talk about that in terms of getting back into what we call not my food, for that sense of ease and comfort, I, I forfeit the opportunity to see what life is going to be like without the aid, the so-called aid of excess food, without the so-called aid of dipping back into not my food to feel a little better about something. And, and in my journey now, two and a half years sober, this is my daily work. I'm bumping into stuff all the time that creates a disturbance within me. And guess what? I'm not turning to food. And so I'm, I'm feeling my feelings. I'm facing it. Um, sometimes we say that fear, you know, it can be uh, fear everything and run or face everything and recover. And since I'm no longer activating that craving um, of body nor the obsession of mind, um, I'm clear headed to say, OK, what do I do in the middle of this feeling that I have? And the, the big book and the path of recovery around the 10 steps is very specific you know, it talks about this is a fact-finding process, a fact-finding mission. It's about causes and conditions. And I now have tools that I can use so that when there's a disturbance within, I've got a path where I can walk down it and shift to a, a different place. And this is all about um, a connection with my, with my higher power that I'll, I'll choose to call it God. And that one quote that you shared, Doreen, where, where the author suggested that if I'm all caught up in being so full of my false self, being large and in charge, it kind of means there's not much room for God. And uh, ego can mean edging God out. And so on my journey, this has been much of my experience is trying to figure out how to make sense of life on my own. And, and um, I'm, th I'm thinking of another phrase from the big book where it talks about that uh, uh, being driven by a hundred forms of fear. And I resonate with that. I, I just do because that's been my experience. Well, you know, when you, you sent me a, a, a text with the authentic true self and the false self. And wow, it was just so eye-opening because this authentic true self. Well, let's talk about the false self first. Because the quote yeah. you referred to was by Richard Rohr. It says, quite simply, there is no room for God within us as long as we are filled with our false selves. And so this authentic or the false self, these are the adjectives, um, anxious, fearful, unsettled, discouraged, depressed, stuck, hiding, pretending, asleep, unaware, alone, scared. And you know, you said something a, a little few minutes ago, Ed, about putting on a happy face. And I can remember so many times being at an event. And as much as I wanted to be present with people, I was thinking about going around the table one more time, you know, that I needed to get that fix of the food one more time. And it, it now is very clear to me, it was you know, I was stuck in the false self there, um, pretending, pretending to be with people when really that's, you know, I've, I've got a different alternative motive here to be here and whether I like it or not. And I remember the first wedding I went to after starting Bright Line Eating, it was in December of the year 2019. I got started in July. And after the wedding, my daughter came up to me and she's like, Mom, you are so different. And I went, what, what do you mean? It's like, you were with us. And it just like, it chokes me up thinking about it. 
I was with them, not just like looking around at the same time as being with someone is not the same as with them. But anyway, the authentic true self is these these are the kinds of adjectives, curiosity and, and nouns, curiosity, compassion, courage, connection, clarity, calm, confidence, and creativity. Um, you know, this is the year of loving focus and some of the, the Zooms we've had. I know, Deb, you're on this call and you said your word for the year was authentic and how getting rid of the food you can kind of start opening up to your authentic self, kind of being in the moment, I think, too. Really what makes you tick, not just always thinking about the food. Does that kind of go with what you were saying, Ed, putting on a happy face? It, it absolutely does. And like I said, I, I was accustomed to hiding and pretending. And I've heard it said some time ago that uh, God doesn't set free a heart that is hiding that is pretending um, because we're not authentic. And, and that idea of being fully present, fully alive in the moment, uh, you know, that's, that's a gift and I'm learning to become more comfortable with that. And for me, a guy that's been in corporate America all my career and still at work, this is where, this is the source of my triggers that happen often. And, um, you know, that I have no doubt that that would be largely what has fueled my food addiction uh, through the years, because it's like all that stuff that I don't want to face. And, uh, you know, as, as we as I mentioned, the big book, and it talks about uh, Bill's story. You know, he's pretty clear about when he first started his drinking career, it was fun. And then he starts to share a little bit more and all of a sudden it's fun with problems. And then toward the, as it continued to build, it was just problems. And I think those of us who have had experience in uh, entering into uh, food addiction or compulsive overeating or obesity or morbid obesity, perhaps we can relate to that. You know, there, there is pleasure in the eating process. And uh, I, I used to have a, uh, are we allowed to say food things? Food yes. Things? You are. I used to have a ritualistic approach as to how I would eat a ho-ho. I don't need to describe it to you, but I can remember at some point in my recovery journey, I thought oh, I got to have two guardrails, and one of them was no ho-hos. You know, representing what I now understand to be not my food. Um, but you know, there wasn't power for me until I completed my last and final research project, the fall of 2020. And I had, I had that little bit of awareness, uh, well, maybe sobriety for a guy like me looks like what it would look like for an alcoholic. And I have friends who are recovered alcoholics. I've got a close friend. He's going to be 85 this summer. He was a nine-year chronic relapser in AA pursuing sobriety that was elusive for him. And now he's been 39 years sober. And if I were to say to an alcoholic friend, well, yeah, I get it that you don't drink, but you know, when do you just have a nip to take the edge off? That, that's not how it works. So in the language of the big book, I now refer to myself as recovered. I'm a recovered compulsive overeater. And my intention is to never go back again. So when I talk about immunity, um, I, I'm not a healthcare person. Deb might be able to help us out with that. But I believe that I'm protected from the disease because I'm not activating it. I'm in a state where I actually have immunity because of my embracing this plan of eating where I've eliminated all my trigger foods. You know, I eat three meals a day, nothing in between. I heard about that long ago in my 12 step program, the three zero one plan, three meals a day, zero in between one day at a time. And I weigh and measure and, you know, I, I eat five things, proper proportions at proper times, uh, protein, vegetables, fruit, uh, fat, and grain. And it's no longer a mystery. I used to struggle so often at the level of the food. Well, can I have that? Can't I? Should I? Shouldn't I? You know, and I would never win. So here's, here's my encouragement to folks. If you are willing to embrace the 100% plan where you're going to follow the fabulous plan and do it for two, three, four weeks, maybe six weeks, you're going to get to a point where the cravings are no longer there because you're not activating it. 
and getting free of the food. Um, I, I know there's some here even in this call that have experienced where there's a healing that goes on in the brain. I don't understand how that works, but I, I've experienced healing in ways that is just incredible. When I want to go back to when you were in the research project, and when I say research, you were into compliant food. Yes, it was. It was compliant. You were into compliant food. Well, the question here is, would you mind sharing which compliant foods you realized you were being triggered by? Well, I'm sure it was a very high caloric, high impact. Of course, this is what I like. 10 minutes a day. You think I could, I could handle that, but I get a bowl out. And I put in, uh, I wasn't waiting and measuring, uh, nuts, cashews, love cashews. And I put in a glob of nut butter and mm. I put in some oat milk. And then I put on top flaxseed, ground flaxseed. And, um, you know, it didn't take me long to consume that. And I thought I could handle it. And, I, you know, I was back to being delusional. And uh, there's a concept called the broken bridge. And for those of us that are addicts, we forget how bad it is. And we think it's not going to be bad this time. And then I can handle it. Yeah. That's a concept out of the big book. And that was, you know, I didn't know I was in the middle of a three-month research project. I thought I was just moving on with life and getting away with something. But Ed, were you? Because you, ju you just said you quit weighing yourself. I did. Well, this was the thing, Noreen. I think... Noreen, Noreen has a saying that if I go back to my old ways, I will go back to my old ways. And this was me thinking that I had sort of arrived. I was in my right size body. I'm feeling good. I think I can handle it. And, uh, you know, in, in, um, I hope nobody is uh, offended by me talking about the AA Big Book, but it just, it just resonates with me. There, there's a story about a guy named Jim um, it, it's, it's an interesting story and he's got some disturbances that happen. You hear about that in a story and all of a sudden he's at this place that he's been at before and he orders milk and then he orders a shot of whiskey and think, I think I can handle it if I just put the shot in the milk. And that went so well, he, he did another experiment with another glass of milk, another sandwich, another shot. And, you know, he ended up going on a bender and, and then it's confusing. Like, well, how did this even happen? And, and this is part of my condition as a compulsive overeater. I had this broken bridge where I forget how bad it is. And so through the decades, I've attempted to, um, you know, eat off plan and think that I could handle it. And yeah. it, it's such a gift for me to be in a place to, to not activate my disease. And I think I've shared this before, but um, I, I wake up every morning. I'm in my right size body. How is this even possible? Everything in my, clo in my closet fits me. And, and that's um, a long, that's a long way from what you described in our first Zoom chat, that you had, you had the sizes marked with your own personalized uh, numbers, right? Yeah, the rings that you go, you see in the retail stores on the racks, it went all the way up to size 54 waist. And, and today I'm in a 32 slim. Wow. Uh, and it's fine. It's, it's, it's fine. And so for those who have had a journey into uh, obesity, morbid obesity, um, you know, it, it, it's a miracle. And uh, I'm stunned, amazed, and just so grateful. But this was not about Ed fixing it. I guess that's my message for, for those of us who can do a food plan with some support and, and do the inner work in a way that means something to you. Uh, that's awesome. I celebrate that. I'm, I'm a part of this community celebrating what people are accomplishing and getting set free. I, I remember one of the people that had an early interview, I just shared this with Noreen, and um, when Deb talked about uh, being her authentic self, boy, I delight in that. And I can remember a vlog that Susan had where she talked about an hourglass. I don't know if anybody remembers that, yes. but where she said it might feel like it's restrictive at the start. You know, this is the, the first two weeks, the first 60 days, but then at some point, as you continue on the path, things start to open up and you're at the bottom of the, of the, of the hourglass and you're starting to experience life in ways that you've never experienced before. And this is a part of my journey. So I'm encouraging people, if you can embrace that idea that 100%, for me, it's way easier and better than 96.3% because you can get beyond the physical effects and start to be clear-headed.
But here's the thing. I, I can't do moderation. So if I think I can, I'm going to go right back into doing another experiment. I want to talk more about some of the inner work because you've done a lot of it with the 12 step programming that you, the 12 step program that you utilize. Um, but I want to also note some of the, the comments in the chat. One says, I don't eat because of cravings. I can't figure out why I binge. And another says, many of us get tripped up with compliant foods. So that kind of goes back to what um, you, you were talking about your own self with your, your deluxe after dinner uh, compliant food to take the edge off, right? Um, mm -hmm. Another comment here, we will do anything to take the edge off. But how long did it take for the obsession to lift? Uh, it's an interesting question, and I didn't take notes on this part of my journey, but when I started Bright Line Eating, having this view of, you know, the weight loss plan, and uh, um, and I was connected in a mastermind group, which sort of uh, was good for a time, and then it sort of faded away, and that was okay. It was for a season. Um, but uh, I'm thinking it was probably somewhere in the three- to six-week range for me, Noreen, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I do, I eat three times a day, but I really don't have the cravings. I can tell when I'm coming up to mealtime and uh, I'll, yeah, I need fuel and uh, that's okay. And it's properly proportioned, but it takes the guesswork out because I'm, I'm no longer doing that. Can I, can't I, should I, shouldn't I game. Um, a couple more comments. Uh, Dub here says ego, ego, E-G-O, edging God out. Authentic self, and this was in the slideshow too, for those who can't see it with the uh, podcast. The authentic self, compassion, curiosity, calm, clarity, creativity, courage, and connectiveness. So those are some of the comments too. And immunity gives you protection. The habits and sticking to the food plan immunizes you or protects you, but you are not immune to the ditch. It can still call us. So, yeah, and, you know, to avoid For every, every mile of road, there's two miles of ditch. I get that. And we live in a culture and a society, you know, you can't really stop and get gas. If you're going to use the restroom, you're just bombarded with all those things. And I, I participated in that for so long, you know, thinking, oh, maybe this can of Pringles will be better than, no, I think the corn nuts are going to be better. You know, it, it, it's yeah. just crazy because now I go in. And I don't even get gum. It's just like, yeah, there's nothing here for me. I, I pack my drinks. If I need a meal, I've got it packed in the car and I've planned ahead. Well, I know like Lori here is a, a, a great uh, superstar in the community with her cooking and her Tasty Freedom book. But she also is on the road a lot and says that the, the gas stations can be your friend because they have microwaves. And if you are traveling, this is somewhere that you can stop if you pre-pack. So if you just think ahead, I, I find that I just travel with food all the time now. I don't leave it to chance that I can find something anymore. And it works out great for me. I think that's key to the preparation and the planning because I don't want to leave it to chance. And I had a funny story when I was flying, I was working in Texas at the end of last month and uh, I had packed my lunch for the plane and I had it in this big foil wrapped thing. And, and the guy across from me just thought it was interesting. So he made a comment, that's like the biggest sandwich I've ever seen. You know, so I unwrap it and it's, it's a bag, a 10 ounce bag of snap peas or snow peas. That was going to be my veggie, two radishes to get to 12 ounces, and then four hard-boiled eggs for my six ounces of protein, and then two small apples for my six ounces of fruit. That was my lunch. I showed him. I said, no sandwich. This is all, uh, you know, this is how I eat now. But um, wow. it was just kind of a fun fun little story that uh, he assumed that it was a, a big sandwich, and it was my compliant meal that I thoroughly enjoyed. Well, I know that when we were heading off to football games this past fall, I packed what I call my picnic in the park lunch, which is, you know, fruit, all raw veggies, two ounces of hummus for the fat, and either two ounces of nuts or I split it half with cheese and half with nuts. So everything is just, you know, grab and eat. And seriously, people wanted that meal. I probably could have sold them because 
it was delicious and it was just great. And, you know, that is the beauty of the program that you can pack things that are really great. I wanted to yeah. talk a little bit more though about the inner work, because as much as you do the 12 step, you stumbled upon something else. Um, Laura Lively has uh, talked about parts work and you took her up on a recommendation of a book. No bad parts. You were saying the other day, can you talk a little bit about your experience with doing that? Yeah, so th this is the, the book here. And I heard Laura do an interview. I think it was on a No Sugar podcast. It was really mm -hmm. more of, of her really giving a talk, not as much of an interview, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. And she recommended the book. Um, and it's kind of written, written for regular people who are interested in the topic, uh, internal family systems, healing trauma and restoring wholeness. And it's about doing that within within oneself. But um, yeah, in those C words that we talk about the authentic self, I believe that uh, Dr. Richard Schwartz is the one who put that together and it's part of the uh, IFS framework. Um, yeah, and it's titled No Bad Parts. And uh, I, I've worked through it a bit and have done some of the exercises and uh, um, came to understand there are still parts of me that are he wounded and not yet fully healed and not even yet fully revealed. And I got to befriend some of um, things that were kind of uh, long-term sort of buried alive. And it was really a meaningful part of my recent work doing the, uh, the inner journey. But, but a bigger part of it, I'll just mention that in, in the 12-step program, it can be summarized, uh, trust God, clean house, help others. And, um, you know, when, when uh, the, the first step is around honesty, uh, powerlessness, unmanageability. Second step is around hope came to believe there's a power greater than myself that could restore my life to sanity. And the third step around turning my life, my will over the care of God. So that's, that's kind of getting positioned to say, okay, I'm going to do this work. And then the fourth step is around a fearless, thorough moral inventory. And later in, in, there's a series of steps to kind of work on authentic process of digging deep, and cleaning up my side of the street. And then the step 10 is we continue to take personal inventory and when wrong, properly admit it. And there's a whole process. When I've got a disturbance, um, I'm invited real time to deal with that. And there, there, there's clarity in the big book as to how that might work. And it involves connection to uh, higher power. And, um, and I find that I often need community uh, connectedness with other people too. But, Am I willing to be honest and vulnerable instead of hiding and pretending about what's real? And I love it. I've got men that I'm very authentic with and, and who are very authentic with me. And it invites me to continue on this deeper journey so that I can be continue to live life in freedom. So when you're, you know, you're, you're utilizing the 12 step, you are now embracing some of this parts work, um, which Honestly, a lot of people, including myself, um, have said, oh, I, it may be kind of like way out there. But the more that I'm realizing um, when you talked about it, there were actually exercises in the book that you came to uncover this particular part in you, right? I mean, it's, it's not like you're just going to read the book and you're going to know all your parts. You have to do some homework with it. Yeah. There, there is work, and uh, but but the author is very generous in kind of laying out uh, the protocol. Here's how to approach this part of you that you want to connect with. Invite inviting this part of me to have a voice. Um, I'm here. I'm 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 wanting to listen. What do you have to say to me? And I was stunned over how this process played out. Um, at least for me. Uh, I haven't gone into it deeply. I certainly couldn't use some of the language that uh, somebody like Laura could use because she's been trained to do that, to help herself as well as others. Um, but, but sometimes I've said that, that the deeper inner work, it's a journey that I don't have to take alone, but it is a journey that I alone must take. And I, I've been avoiding that even in much of my recovery journey. Um, I'm the kind of guy that wants the quick fix. Tell me what to do. How do I, and, uh, you know, honoring these parts of us in our journey 
it's important. I can't do, I was just telling a friend, I can't just go from fear to faith. I can't, I can't say, well, I'm, I'm not supposed to be afraid, so therefore I'm not. I've got to work an authentic process so that I can actually take a journey from being stuck and suck to a place where I'm feeling free. And this other author I'm reading, she's got this saying that stress, which I bump into often stress, I've got two choices when I face stress. Either one, it's going to reinforce this story of scarcity. I don't have what it takes. I don't have enough. I'm alone. Or the other choice is it's going to open up <clears throat> this sacred connection where I can bump into joy. But how? I mean, but how do you do that? I mean, that does seem so broad that I mean, it's either one or the other. Where does it crack open? So it, it's for me, it's, it's in the sequence of step 10 and step 11. Continue to take personal inventory. So when I get a disturbance, I'm stressed. And for me, oftentimes it feels like this, I'm not going to survive this one. I don't know if anybody remembers Sanford and Son, but uh, the old man would often say, oh, this is the big one, Elizabeth, I'm coming. Because he would, you know, but I, I have that reaction within me. Yes, when totally. I'm, when I have that disturbance, promptly admit it. Um, I used to think, oh, that means, you know, every four months when I'm unkind to my wife, I've got to apologize. And I've come to find out when I've got a disturbance and then step 11 says sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will and the power to carry it out. And there are some specific um, sequences, steps in the big book as to how to do that. So I can say, God, I'm afraid. I've got, I've got this thing going on and I don't know what to do. And ask him, re remove my fear. Help me to understand what would it look like for a me, a, a guy like me, to trust infinite God rather than trusting my finite self. What would that look like? What would the next right thing be? Okay, X and Y. Now give me the courage to do X and Y. And then it's a program of action. Trusting God's got me. I'm going to do X and Y. That's the next right thing. But for me, I sometimes forfeit that process and I stay suck and suck because I feel like I'm in a dark place all along. Right. I mean, and, and even trying to create the path for someone else in your head, like as if you can control what they should do. I mean, it's, that's, that's part of my journey is like, I need to let go. And you know, it's not even my journey to take. So there's a section in the big book where it talks about that we like to think that we're the director of the show, and we tell how the lights are supposed to go and how the stage is supposed to look. And if people would only follow my script and, you know, in, in recovery, we're taught that, oh, we're, you know, there is a God. And the good news is I'm not God. I got to quit playing God and recognize that I've got a part to play and I get to do that to the best of my ability. What's, then it becomes, what's my assignment? What's my part in this versus I'm responsible to get people to follow my script? So, so for it, those who are going to be watching this later, I want to mention one thing in the chat. Laura Lively, we mentioned, and lauralively.com has it has a free four-step e-course and offers a free 50-minute parts work session. So go over to lauralively.com for that. I wanted to mention that. Okay, so you've generously written many, many posts, Ed. This past week, you you shared a one thing. And, you know, we've had this year of loving focus and starting out bright. And one of them was the one thing. Wendy Laterza has got this great daily post. And we put in what's our one thing to do today. But you shared the YouTube video of a little clip of one thing. Talk about that for a second. Did you watch it, Noreen? I did. Yeah. And this was from City Slicker. It was a movie from long ago. I saw it referenced in a book. and. Uh, and it talked about Jack Valance and, and him talking about one thing. And I wasn't remembering it. So I watched the video clip and, you know, he's the old cowboy, a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. He's on his, his horse, Billy Crystal, the city slickers on his horse. And they're talking and uh, it's like this old man can kind of see into the city slicker, what he's about, what he's trying to get. And he finally comes to this place. He said, it's all about this. And Billy Crystal says, a, a, a finger, a finger. He says, no, it's all about one thing. And then Billy Crystal's on the edge of his horse, you know, tell me what's the one thing. And, and the old guy says, that's for you to figure out. 
And th that's my encouragement. You know, we're sitting here with uh, Noreen, who courageously, generously started this community um, for reasons that were her responding to spirit saying, yes, I'm willing to do what you're asking me. And Deb is here doing every day encouragement and she engages on people's posts. And these are two women who have received a gift and they're giving back to the community. And so are so many other people. Um, and this is part of it. Uh, you know, trust God, clean house, help others. Um, you know, I am passionate about my desire to give back to those because when I say the struggle is real, I've been a guy that gets it. 330 pounds, long-term chronic morbid obesity with some complications and freedom is possible. And, and so what's the one thing that's part of the discovery process that we get to figure out. You know, sometimes I've invited people from our starting out bright community to say, Hey, if you're interested, you know, listen to this podcast, uh, uh, Ruth M in an OA meeting talking about um, app, uh, what should you call it? Entire abstinence. Um, mm -hmm. Entire the, the idea that it's it's a hundred percent. You know, there are no middle of the road solutions. And um, my my home meeting is a Monday night meeting, six p.m. Central Time. It's an open meeting. People are welcome to come, and there are people there who have authentic recovered lives and they keep coming back because that's part of what we do. And we, uh, we, we share from our experience, strength and hope. But, but here's the thing, even though I say I'm recovered and I'm living with this immunity, I'm not cured. And all the crazy stuff that would drive me to the food, it's still there, but I now have tools that I can use rather than turning to the food. And I knew there was something inauthentic about me. When I have one hand saying, God, I trust you. And yet I'm 330 pounds and my hand is in a bag of not my food. There's something inauthentic about that. And, there's, and part of what's happening is I'm becoming more wholehearted. I'm becoming less focused on myself, which oftentimes my fears are very self-absorbed. And I'm learning to be more others focused. And I'm learning to be in the flow of, I am not the director of the show. And I think God has a sense of humor because my actual literal title at my job, senior director. <laughs> but I'm learning, I'm learning that's, that's an assignment. That's an invitation. It's not my identity. That's I want to just, I want to just share a little thing. I haven't shared this before, but it's something that I have on my wall here that I look at every day. What is the most important thing I can do today? And you can take that for whatever way you want to, but way up there is, is um, staying bright because out of that, many other, I, when I'm not, I find that I am all those things that are hiding and not my true self, but when I am bright, I feel like I can give more, I can serve more because I'm not thinking about me. And, yeah. you know, the shame and everything that goes with it. We're running out of time here, Ed. And I do want to ask one question. What in the world has changed in your life so, so much more than just the weight that, you know, that is the non-scale victory in your life? So, and I'm going to reference the big book again. It talks about that most of us live lives of self-propulsion and it doesn't turn out very well. Um, I did a talk for a 12-step uh, compulsive overeating recovery group back in February, and, and there's a phrase out of the big book where it says, most alcoholics have to be pretty badly mangled before they commence to solve their problems. My life has been one that has been pretty badly mangled. And part of what I'm finding to be very interesting is, uh, you know, I'm 61 years old, I, I'm still working, uh, the retirement line doesn't appear to be any time near term, um, you know, but, and I'm bumping into these stressors that are very challenging for me. And it was, it was March of this year that I started my, my special journey. My wife got me this for Christmas. And I remember thinking I would never spend this kind of money, you know, a leather journal with my initials in it. And, uh, but there was something that was happening in me, something new, where I, I pulled it out March 8th, and I said, this is going to be my notebook for my, my pilgrimage to presence. 
my having my own authentic experience with God in the middle of the messy edges of my own life. And that's been the, something new for me, Noreen. I've got my everyday journal, which is just brown paper. But this is where I'm, I'm writing down, oh, here's evidence where I saw something of God's hand in the middle of my struggle. That's wonderful. And, uh, and here's the thing. We're all invited. We are all invited. I, I, I love the saying, thinking about a, a recovery room, come all the way in, sit all the way down, say your name out loud, and join us. Um, this is a we program. It, it's not a me program. That's so fantastic, Ed. So here we are. The last question. But before I get to that, let me just double check here. Um, maybe this is the question. What can you tell someone who is off again, on again, can't string more than a few bright days together? What would you say to them? So I actually have those conversations with, with real people from time to time. Um, and my heart goes out to them. And, and uh, you know, one of the slogans uh, from recovery that I always loved was keep coming back until the miracle happens to you. And I've been a guy that's been willing to keep coming back, even though I drop out. My most recent time of coming back was uh, November of 2019, a few months before I discovered the Bright Line Eating book. And uh, ahead of Bright Line, I was not absent for those three months. I could not, as a friend of mine says, catch a gear and uh, string together even a day of abstinence. Um, so somehow, um, you know, I, I like to say that what we're talking about here now, it's, it's at a six-way intersection of miracle, mystery, grace, surrender, acceptance, willingness. When you struggle at the level of the food, it is perplexing. You know, the big book says that addiction is cunning, baffling, and powerful. For those of us that know something about food addiction, it's also persistent, it's persuasive, it's pervasive, it's all consuming. It's a horrible taskmaster. 330 pounds. I'd have to measure my steps thinking how far away from the door am I going to park and are there stairs? Um, you know, knowing what it's like to work up a sweat when I'm just walking to get from one place to the other and then having to figure out what am I going to do with this sweaty body. And there's so many other things that I could share. Uh, but, but that's my encouragement. Keep coming back. And with respect to that, that cowboy saying, yeah, one thing, that's what you've got to figure out. That's the invitation. And when I say we're all invited, um, I, I've got a special painting in my office here at home that I purchased from an artist that I know. And um, she described it as a, about the prodigal son. And it's a beautiful picture where the, and her caption is, the gate is always open. And um, I like to title it, uh, uh, The Bright Path, We're All Invited, because it looks like there's sunshine coming through this field, and the gate is open, but the gate is always open. And th this is the invitation from the God of the universe to say, you know, let's give it a try. Come. Ed. You're just amazing, and your humility shines through what you've shared tonight. Um, I know that someone here and someone who's going to be watching this is going to take a few steps forward and, and make a beeline for the bright path, because what you're offering is really hope, and um, I've, I've received it tonight, and I just thank you so much for sharing your story and just sharing from your heart, your authentic self, just what your life is like and, you know, what is available. Well, well thank you, Noreen. And, and uh, you know, if anybody wants tips on plugging into a 12-step fellowship, um, I, I've been having conversations with individuals who've been reaching out. And, I, you know, I'm invited to share from my experience, my strength, and my hope, and to connect authentically with people where they're at. So if somebody's suffering and struggling, I'd say, I get it. And my heart goes out to you, and freedom is possible for, for everyone. It really is. Well, Ed, again, thank you so much. Um, and with that, I'm going to close as I do each week. And uh, again, thank you, everyone, for being here. Again, Ed, you know, you've given so much. And for those who haven't joined Starting Out Bright, Ed is in the group. So come on over. It's a private group. Come on over and join us. 
as as you said, it's not a journey you have to take alone. You alone must take it, but let's do it together. So beautifully said, Mary. Beautifully said. Thank you. So thanks everyone. Good night. Stay bright. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Good night, everybody. So Ed, how would you like to play three question Thursday? Let's do it, Noreen. All right. You know, you said this is a not a me program. It's a we program. So what in depth do you do besides the 12 step? You met, mentioned you had been in a mastermind. You've got a buddy that you you do your food with, right? What are the other things that you do to stay focused and together? Yeah, so I, I am plugged into my uh, my twelve step uh, fellowship for compulsive overeaters. I, I'm being cautious not to not to name it because they're, they're you know I said Ed P. Everybody knows my name from the Facebook page, but wanting to honor the traditions there. But but um, I, I believe so much in what we're talking about that freedom is possible. That um, I'm okay sharing my side by side picture. You know, I'm I'm not a representative of the program, but I'm a representative of God doing a miracle in my life. And uh, I find it amazing that this book, written back in the 1930s, it, it speaks to me. And uh, I'll just show you my inside cover, and it's kind of like this throughout. But um, just all these all these notes, references, because wow. I go back to it often. I'm sorry, I forgot the question. I got on. I think that you covered it because you. I think you do Marco Polo too, right? Yeah, I, I do Marco Polo. I'm actually in uh, one Zoom um, uh, compulsive overeating fellowship meeting a week, and I do three in person men meeting, men's meeting. It's something called Celebrate Recovery, which is a faith based twelve step program, and. Uh, the, I'm in a group where, where there's men, each of these three meetings, so it's Wednesday morning, I go Saturday morning, I go Sunday morning, and there's between 15 to 25 men there. And I, I love it where it's, it's kind of atypical, oftentimes when you're introducing yourself, you want to start with, you know, something really bright about you, right? And we go all around the room and, you know, I, I say I'm a recovered compulsive overeater. I'm, I'm exposing the biggest issue in my life, another right. person. Uh, alcohol, I'm, I'm here because of my alcoholism or drug addiction or whatever the case may be. So these are the men that I, and I'm going to retreat next week, Wednesday through Sunday up in Wisconsin with these men. And you know what? You, you hit on something, Ed, that I see over and over that I saw in that first group that I joined when I started Bright Line Eating. And that is to, to be vulnerable the friendships formed because of that. Like you said, you're putting it all right out there. And, you know, and then if you have a then and now photo, I mean, you're really like, whoa. Like, you know, it, the last thing on my mind was that I would ever be talking about my weight publicly. So here I am just blowing that out of the water. <laughs> but because, you know, you just love these people so much. I mean, you truly become such friends. You just want to share and help if you can, you know, what you've learned. Yeah, uh, and so, sometimes I'll, I'll see somebody and my mind goes toward this term, the walking wounded. And, and oh, I've yes. been walking wounded. But I, I, I can't just walk up to somebody and try to extend hope because that would be offensive. But here we are in a community where we're all here because we want to be here and we're desiring something and we could do it. You know, um, I, I, somebody was struggling in the community and I said, when one of us suffers, we all suffer. You know, it's not about each of us trying to get ahead of the other. It's about us getting across the finish line together. That's really what it's yes. about. Yes. I, I want to ask you a question about the journaling. Is it through the journaling that you get the inspiration for these wonderful posts that you create? Or do they just come to you in the morning or what? How do you do that? So my, my morning time is very special to me. And this is kind of where I get to have some me time. I'm fresher. I've got my cup of coffee. And uh, I do have several books that I like to use to kind of get some ideas flowing. But, but part of it is me wanting to have this authentic connection uh, with God and remembering that I'm not alone. And that's really a big part of it. And, um, but my journaling, it's about some of what's going on in, in me, in my life, what I'm learning from something that I'm reading, uh, how it ties together. 
Uh, I'm not much of an artist, but I might draw little uh, things in there that are helpful to me. But it's kind of me just having um, time to get focused and centered. I hear so much gratitude from you in every single post, you know, when you describe the miracle. But I just want to end with this last question because it was powerful to me when you talked about it the other day. And and you said there was a, a quote by Mark Houston. That yeah, so Mark Houston, is a, he's a talker in the AA circuit. Um, I've heard his story. He's passed away now, I think, probably in 2010. But a lot of these podcasts are available. And if you're interested, you can just say, you know, AA speaker, Mark Houston, and you'll get a lot of options. But um, I remember this, this one talk that he was giving. He said, um, stop wor worshiping the fingers. And, and I could only, it was just audio, but I could imagine a whole bunch of things. If, you're, if you think the magic's in the sponsor or the magic's in the book or the magic's in the medium, we can add, if you think the magic's in the food plan, these are all pointers inviting you to have an authentic, transformative experience with the living God. Stop worshiping the fingers. And, and another AA speaker said a similar thing that so many people want to memorize this and, and be studied up on that. And, and, and they want to eat the menu. The menu is a description to the feast that's available to us. And it's all about having this authentic connection with God. And I've been, I've been a man in a particular faith stream really all, all my life. Um, but it's interesting. It's just like I described at 330 pounds saying, God, I trust you, but my hand's in a bag. You know, I'm kind of a practi practicing agnostic. I can say with my mouth, I trust you, but in my heart, I'm putting my trust in whatever this food is going to do for me in the moment. And I, I know very little of trusting God authentically. And this is part of what I'm bumping into here at 61 years of age is an invitation for me to have my own authentic experience with God in a way that changes me. That's what I'm, that's what I'm engaged in. That's so great. Um, everything that you said, I mean, there's just going to be so much that I have to go back and listen to this video when it's out there on YouTube. I, I just want to give one affirmation. Our community is awesome. I, I'm buying a custom-made mug from a friend that I've never met that's a part of this community. I saw her post on it, and she was gracious enough to let me sign up to get a cat mug for my daughter. And um, you know, I had a situation where I needed a friend in a particular way, and, and Deb Babcock dropped everything and became that friend for a family member in need. But this is what we do. We, we care for each other in ways that really make a difference. And, uh, you know, Noreen started this because of a, a response she had to God saying, Noreen, I'm inviting you to something more. And she said, okay, and look, at, look at where we are. I just think it's amazing. So thanks to everybody for contributing. And uh, let's lean in. What's your unique gift and how do you bring that into this community? Yes, I want to hear about it right here. So hit me up. So yeah, again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. And thank you for playing Three Question Thursday. It's thank you. Really Thanks, everybody. Good night, my friend. Good night, everybody. Stay bright. Well, good night. Good night.